Hi, welcome to Elliot High Network. I'm your host, Iomi Wolf from Wilson High School, coming to you not so live with my new hair color. The Washington Teachers Union has launched a major initiative called Learning Doesn't Stop, Lessons on TV. Let's check out our first lesson with Ms. Crump from Cardoza High School. Lesson two will be connected by Alicia Butler from Wikimedia Tech Educational Center. Now let's get to learning. Hey everybody, this is Brandy Crump, instructional coach at Cardoza Education Campus. Can you believe we are already in week seven of at-home learning, but we're trucking through together. I have a super fun lesson planned for us today that you are not going to want to miss, but you know me. What's the lesson if it's not making you think critically and analyze? Tune in. All right, today's topic is close reading an image. I told you it was gonna be interesting. Analyzing with a critical eye. Did you realize that you can look at an image, a photo, an ad, and close read it the same way that you close read a text in your English class? All right, well, let's go. We are gonna use a college level strategy called the rhetorical situation, but we're only gonna use part of it. And I tweaked it a little bit because I know that we are in 11th grade or either whatever high school grade you are tuning into this. The rhetorical situation is simply a way that you critically think about a picture that you are looking at. So you analyze it. So the rhetorical situation that we are going to use today is the caption. What do you see in the image? The audience. For whom is the image intended? The purpose. Why was this image created? And the tone. What emotions does the image stir when you look at it? So let's start with caption. I know you guys are all on IG and you make captions all the time. So look at this image for a second. How would you caption this image? Let's go ahead and say what we see. Quarantine dogs race out of the house at the first sight of freedom. <laughs> that one's a little bit dramatic. And then dog jumps over friend in valiant effort to get outside. Those are my captions, right? It tells you what's happening in the picture. Next, our audience. This one is very important. When you think of audience, who is supposed to be looking at this image or who is your target? So if we look at this one on the left, what do you see? It's a little girl in a unicorn float and looks like a pool, right? But then we see something that says two handles, two extra airbags. So when the creators made this image, who do you think their target audience was? Possibly kids, right, who might want to have a fun toy for the pool. But then if you look deeper, when you look at the words, who else could be the intended audience? Who would care about two extra airbags or handles? Yep, parents or adults who are actually buying this um, unicorn inflatable toy for the pool. Also, the audience would be people who have access to a pool or a beach people who are shopping in the summertime. All of these things are what you need to keep in mind when you're look, looking at this image. Then look at this one on the right to contrast. We have um, a watch on what is actually a man's hand. Who's the audience for this? Is it the same audience as in the unicorn picture? Mm, probably not. Look how the man is dressed. The audience possibly might be uh, business people who want a nice watch, who want to tell time, who can tell time, possibly shopping for themselves or for someone else, right? So these two images show a contrast in who the audience is, but it's always important to think about who is the person looking at the picture. Next, we have the purpose. Or why was this image created? So since your eyes are probably already going to this little dancing thing down here, let's look at the image on the right. So this is, looks like maybe the glow stick challenge during quarantine. Oh, the first picture on top is the glow sticks on them in the light. 
And then the bottom picture is them dancing. So what is the purpose of this? Possibly to entertain or maybe to teach people how they can achieve this glow stick dancing, to entertain people how they can have fun while they're locked in their houses, right? Maybe teach you something. All right. What about the purpose of this image on the left? We see go slow, whoa. So there's a quick little slogan. Eat anytime, go. Eat anytime. Low in calories, very healthy. I see carrots, orange, apple. Slow. Eat several times a week. Medium in calories, healthy. Eggs, looks like some kind of juice and maybe raisins. And whoa, eat only now and then. High in calories, not so healthy. I see some soda pop and looks like some fries and some chips. So why was this image created? This image looks like maybe like a campaign or to like teach or inform, right? Um, not necessarily persuade, but possibly, right? It's just trying to tell people how you should um, eat in this life to maintain your health. Next, we have tone. When you look at this, what images, I mean, what emotions come up? How does it make you feel? I love this picture to the left. It's uh, from a famous artist by Squat. And it might stir up images, uh, feelings of rage or uh, some passion, intensity, right? We don't know. Or if you look at the image on the right, you see a man with crutches who looks like his leg was amputated. But wait, he is on rollerblades. So the tone of this image or how it makes one feel, it might at first be sympathetic or sad because you see he's missing a leg. But then as you look closer, you see he's on a rollerblade and he's smiling. He is living his best life, right? So it is inspirational, it's motivational. It's possibly saying that you cannot let things get you down. You have to keep on pushing. Okay, so the lesson this week is from this here, the superhero photographs of the Black Lives Matter movement by Tehu Cole. We're going to go deeper using that rhetorical strategy method to analyze some of the images that you're going to analyze for your assignments. So first caption, always look at the picture closely, take it in. What do you see? What do you notice? What are people doing? So here's a caption I created. African-American man holding compelling sign during a Black Lives Matter rally. What do you notice his uh, sign says? I'm not a threat. In the back I see stop racist police terror. Um, to the left it looks like justice now, right? People are marching. Now, using the same image, who is our intended audience? Now here you'll see just a couple suggestions. It could be all of them, it could be one, or it could be a couple of them. So I think that this image was captured for people interested in the Black Lives Matter movement, but also the antithesis, right? People who may not be interested in this movement. Why people who may not, right? When you have this sign right here as the focal point, I'm not a threat, it's going to capture people's attention. So people who may not normally have cared or wanted to involve themselves, all of a sudden they're captivated by what they see here. Um, this could be intended for the police to tell them that he's not going to hurt anybody. Of course, for people who view black men as threats and then possibly lawmakers, change makers, right, to try and um, influence society in a, in a type of way. Could be intended for a lot of different audiences. Then we have purpose. Why was this uh, photo captured? Why was this picture taken? Um, it could be to create awareness, to foster public outrage, right? So if enough people see it, they'll be upset about some of these um, incidents that happened that spawned this Black Lives Movement. Uh, matter movement um, to notify people that black men are not threats, right? Simple notification. Uh, to also get the media's attention, right? To, to draw them in. It could be a plea to police to stop their brutal killings, or it simply could be a demonstration of a peaceful protest, 
looks like nobody is fighting or angry in this picture. So it could be showing that, hey, look, we want to make change, but we're doing so in a peaceful way. Lastly, we have tone, right? Or what does this image say to you? What does it make you feel, right? These are adjectives, so uh, it's powerful, peaceful. It could be alarming that a man actually has to hold a sign saying this, or it shows like a type of unification that people are coming together. Let's look at one more image, and we're gonna put all of those together using um, different colors. So go ahead and look at this image and take it in. What do you notice? What do you see? What does it make you feel? Who do you think this is for? Why was this created? All right, so here's a little quick paragraph I wrote about this. This photograph portrays an iconic image during a Black Lives Matter protest. It appears to be an African-American male standing between protesters and fully armed police officers. The image is intended for people following the movement to portray the people want peace between the people and the police. The image ignites a hint of fear and suspense as the audience does not know what will happen next. So if you look at this, you see in red is the caption, right? It, it directly tells you what you see. It appears to be an African-American male standing between protesters and fully armed police officers. Then what's in blue? It's our audience. The image is intended for people following the movement. But if you look at what I did here, uh, the syntax of the way this is written, the purpose is also intertwined in that same sentence. To portray the people want peace between the people and the police. And then lastly, the tone. The image ignites a hint of fear and suspense, right? As the audience does not know what will happen next. So I'm looking at this image again and looking at the police officers on the side the ones who are in shields in the front, the people that he is standing in front of, right? All of that in this image. All right, so analyzing images can be very fun, but as for the rest of your life, when you're on IG or looking through magazines or looking at billboards, I want you to always think critically because images talk, they speak to us, even if there are not words in it. And the way that you can hear or listen to these image images is by looking at them, reading them, close reading them analytically and with a critical eye. To close out, here are a couple of tone word, word resources. We know that tones can be positive or negative. Sometimes they're neutral. You can go ahead and Google a tone words list and it'll help you. These are just a few, but remember for high school, I want you to use words that have power, that speak um, advanced words that are truly going to help you to capture what you're seeing. All right, that's the lesson for today. I hope that it was very helpful. And again, I want you to always look at everything critically. Don't just take it for surface value. All right, so for this lesson and others like it, log on to www.wtulocal6.net. Have a good day, guys. Hello, everyone. My name is Alicia Butler, and I'm an 11th grade US history teacher for the District of Columbia Public Schools. Today I'm going to be talking about Unit 7, and our essential question is, to what extent was Brown versus Board a success? All right, ladies and gentlemen, our objectives basically are to identify and explain the origins of Brown versus Board of Education, explain the effects of the court ruling, evaluate its legacy, and determine to what extent it was a success. Our academic purpose is to provide students with contextual background, also known as historical background information, about the assignment's area of focus. We also have a civic purpose, and that's to help students to become better educated on the debate surrounding education reform, and as a result, become better informed voters. First, how can we make this presentation work for you? Don't try to copy every word. Write down all terms in bold print, listen for and record the main ideas, 
analyze the images to help explain and reinforce the text in the presentation, and keep that essential question visible and see how each slide helps to answer it. Now, just like to review a strategy I introduced to you when we first began, how to use Cornell Notes. Basically, you write the essential question down here at the top of your page. You listen to the actual lecture, take notes, and notes from the presentation go in the center under Notes. After you're done, go back and review your notes. Try to construct questions that can only be answered by the notes that you've written down here in the center of your paper. And then lastly, go back, look at your notes, look at your questions, and use all that information to answer the essential question, which um, goes right here under the summary. Another strategy I introduced to you when we last met was charting. Charting works very well for history lectures. It helps to show relationships. It definitely can be used for essential questions that deal with cause and effect. Basically, how it works is you write down the major events here, you listen for and write down the cause of these events and the effects, and then probably the most important aspect of charting is to go back and really look for the significance. What was the importance of the events, the cause and effects that you wrote down? And just like Cornell notes, you take all this information, go back, review it, and you try to use it to answer the essential question, which goes right here in the area known as summary. All right, so let's begin. What are the origins of Brown versus Board? They definitely stem from Reconstruction, which took place from 1865 to 1876. The Civil War basically ends in 1865, and Congress passes the 13th Amendment, which gives African Americans freedom. However, freedom does not come with its own obstacles. African Americans are faced with um, not having lands, having a shortage of money, not having resources, or not having any protection. And ex-Confederates are extremely angry and very resentful that they've lost the war. They um, enact violence, they intimidate African Americans, and a lot of African American communities are subject to massacres that do take place throughout the South. Lincoln and Johnson's Reconstruction Plans failed to provide adequate protection and address the needs of freed men and freed women. So as a result, Congress intervened with their own Reconstruction Plan. Congressional Reconstruction was led by radical Republicans, and it focused, to an extent, on providing blacks with the resources that they needed during Reconstruction. Their Reconstruction Plan included the 14th Amendment, and that was very important because the 14th Amendment gave blacks citizenship, which means that black people are given equal protection under law. And this particular amendment is going to be central to being able to really answer our essential question and understanding the events that surrounded Brown versus Board of Education. Congressional Reconstruction also gave the 15th Amendment, which basically gave black men the ability to vote, or it gave them suffrage. A really cool way that you can remember all of these constitutional Reconstruction Amendments is through an acronym that I love to introduce to my students known as Free Citizens Vote. Free Citizens Vote. Freedom, 13th Amendment, Citizenship, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, the right to vote. Free citizens can now vote because of constructional reconstruction. In addition to these amendments, Congress also placed the military throughout the South to offer protection for African Americans so that they can actually exercise these rights. As a result of that, ladies and gentlemen, we had some of our first black members of Congress elected during this time period. 1870, you have um, Hiram Rebels. He is elected from Mississippi to the Senate. Um, then you also have states like Alabama, South Carolina, and Florida also see African American men begin to hold office. You also, as a result of construction and reconstruction, begin to see um, schools that are established for African Americans. However, by 1872, a lot of Republicans really just want to move on, and President Ulysses S. Grant at this time signs into law the Amnesty Act. The Amnesty Act of 1872 removed voting restrictions and office-holding disqualifications against most of the ex-Confederates. So now, Democrats are able to retake control over the state governments. But perhaps the final nail to the coffin of Reconstruction, which brings it to an end, is known as the Compromise of 1877. Rutherford B. Hayes is a Republican, and he's running um, to be the President of the United States against Samuel Tilden, who was a Democrat. And remember, because of the new Amnesty Act, a lot of Democrats have now, they have their right to vote back, and the election is looking very, very close. The Democrats might actually win. Um, Tilden and Hayes struck, uh, strike a deal, and Tilden basically said that he would not contest the election if Hayes agreed to pull the remaining troops out of the South. 
Now, can you imagine how African Americans felt? Congress has given them free citizens' vote, freedom, the right to citizenship, equal protection under the law, and also the right to vote. And the military was really there to make sure that black people were able to exercise these votes. But after the compromise, ladies and gentlemen, the soldiers are pulled out. So that protection that African Americans needed pretty much is gone. And because of that, you begin to see the rise of a group of people known as the Redeemers. The Redeemers were whites who wanted the South to basically rise again. And once they received their right to vote and were voted back into office, they began to pass laws that really began to chip away at those amendments that we had talked about that Congress had basically passed. So, for example, the Black Codes were laws that Redeemers quickly began to pass, and it discriminated against African Americans and restricted their rights. So, for example, many states during the South uh, that had passed Black Codes these laws limited basic rights. For example, in certain states, it was law that black people, you know, um, were not allowed to speak loudly in the presence of white women. In certain states, uh, you had black coats that made it a crime for black people to stay on the ground. Um, other states, you had laws uh, that were black coats that basically said black people could not be out past a certain time. And then perhaps one of the most devastating and most impactful law was known as the vagrancy laws. And that basically required all African Americans to be able to prove that they had some type of employment. And if you could not you could be arrested ladies and gentlemen now if you violated these black codes and there were so many of them you could be uh, sent to prison and you could get caught up in what's known as the convict lease system and the convict lease system basically it goes like this black people are convicted of very very menial crimes like the black codes they're sentenced to time in prison and once they get to prison the prisons um, basically would lease them out to private companies and they would be forced to work and what you begin to see happen was basically slavery by another name. Now, that pretty much limits African Americans' freedom, the 13th Amendment. So how do Redeemers limit the 15th Amendment, their right to vote? They do that by passing certain tests known as literacy tests, excuse me, certain laws known as literacy tests. And the literacy tests basically made it very, very difficult to vote, impossible to vote if you couldn't pass certain tests. Now, I always tell my students that name literacy test really can make you seem to believe, oh, these are just tests that you had to pass to be able to prove that you were literate. Mm -mm, that was not true. They were very, 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 very difficult civic tests. Um, in addition to that, ladies and gentlemen, they also, redeemers, begin to pass laws known as the poll taxes, which means that if you want to vote, you got to pay. And most African Americans in the South during this time period are trapped in a very oppressive economic system known as sharecropping. And in the end, sharecropping basically basically always leaves African Americans in, vote, um, in debt. So they already don't have money, um, ladies and gentlemen, and now having to use money to be able to vote makes voting pretty much impossible. And then lastly, another effect of the Compromise of 1877 is now that the soldiers are gone, black people are pretty much left without protection against a lot of the violence that we talked about in the beginning and against the Klan. So I talked about how the Redeemers sought to limit black people's ability to really enjoy and exercise the 13th and the 15th Amendment. What about the 14th Amendment, which is essential to today's discussion? Well, the courts began to weaken the 14th Amendment with the civil rights cases of 1883. The Supreme Court basically ruled that Congress could not legislate against the racial discrimination practiced by private citizens, which included businesses used by the public. But perhaps the most daunting um, Supreme Court ruling was that with Plessy versus Ferguson. Um, it basically ruled that the Supreme Court um, upheld a Louisiana law that required separate but equal accommodations for white and black passengers. And basically the, the problem started when Homer Plessy was trying to get onto a train and he was denied the ability to get on that train because they had said that that train was only reserved for whites and that he had to be forced to ride on the black train. Um, and he said, this is a violation of my 14th Amendment rights. I am not being treated equally under the law. But like I said, the Supreme Court basically ruled against him and they said that um, separate but equal um, definitely is um, legal as long as both facilities are equal in standards. So what does this do? What are the implications of that? Segregation now, it becomes rampant throughout the South and more importantly, legal throughout the South. And segregation is not just applied to transportation, riding a train. It also now is applied to anything such as washrooms, fountains, park benches, and schools. And like you can see for these pictures that the accommodations were never equal. They were always separate, but never equal. 
This is applied also to our schools. But African Americans do fight back, and we begin to see challenges to Plessy versus Ferguson with Belton versus Gebhardt in Delaware. Um, and you also had challenges right here in the District of Columbia with Bowling versus Sharp. The major win comes with Brown versus Board of Education, 1954, Topeka, Kansas. Basically, NAACP lawyers that are led by Thurgood Marshall um, argue that segregation of black children in the public schools was unconstitutional because it violated the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection under the law. And at the time, Chief Justice Earl Warren agreed, and he ruled that separate facilities are not equal. And... He basically argued that school segregation had to end with all deliberate speed. So I'm going to pause right here because I really want you all to kind of think about how could this be problematic? It's great. He says that segregation is is not legal. It's the facilities are unequal. But then he demands that southern schools segregate, oh, desegregate with all um, deliberate speed, with all deliberate speed. You could be moving at a snail's pace and say, hey, I'm moving with all deliberate speed. He failed to provide a timeline for when everything had to be desegregated. So what were the reactions to Brown versus Board of Education? Over 100 members of Congress signed the Southern Manifesto, condemning the Supreme Court for clear abuse of what they thought was judicial power. Public schools in Virginia closed their doors. They would rather close down school for everybody as opposed to open up their schools to integration. There became this big push if you had the money for private schools. The KKK made a huge comeback in the 50s and violence against black people skyrocketed all over the South. Governors like Oval Favis used the state's National Guard to prevent black people from entering into a school they were trying to integrate. And by 1964, less than 2% of blacks in the South had in attended integrated schools, 10 years after the ruling. So now it's time for me to stop and for you to decide. Your assignment for this unit and your packet basically is for you to determine to what extent was Brown versus Board of Ed a success. So you are given a series of charts and documents that you're supposed to analyze. Before you analyze them, I wanna leave you with some questions for you to really be able to understand and answer that essential question by using the documents. Before you begin to analyze the information and statistics, you should ask yourself, how do you define successful? How much of a change do you need to see in order for you to deem that something is successful or not? How fast should you see those schools desegregating? Is the level of desegregation consistent? Do you see any drops in any of the charts that you're going to analyze? Are there any differences in some in regions? Are some regions desegregating quicker than others? Do you see any difference in the desegregation of application schools versus neighborhood schools? And do not forget constantly to keep into your um, back of your mind as you're analyzing these documents and these statistics, what role is gentrification playing in these? Ladies and gentlemen, I hope that this particular um, presentation was um, helpful. And um, just want to let you know that we DCPS teachers miss you all like crazy and can't wait to see you all again. See you soon.